Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Keep the Line Moving, the podcast designed to talk about leadership, life, and inspiration. I'm your host, Chris Gargano, and for episode 76, our topic is seizing the moment. Let that sink in. If you're a college grad, this time of year, college graduates are looking for jobs, internships. Should they continue their education? Those are difficult choices and choices that our guest helps students navigate on a daily basis. His name, Dr. Rich Cellini. He teaches critical thinking and leadership at the very popular graduate program at the University of San Francisco Sports Management. That is what Rich does because he has also lived the life that the college grads are experiencing now. He had his own journey getting his doctorate degree. We will talk about that. In addition to running a parallel career path as a broadcaster, he's worked for all the major networks, including being the voice of the California Golden Bears basketball team for many years, in addition to being part of the preseason broadcast teams for the 49ers, the Cardinals, and the Chargers in the NFL. How do you stand out in the marketplace? That's what this conversation is about with Rich Cellini on Keep the Line Moving. All right, look who it is. My friend, Dr. Rich Cellini. Rich, I have been a guest speaker in your USF classes a couple of times, and I loved the style, the relaxed nature, and the relationships that you cultivate with your students. And I can go on and on. And, you know, and as I was getting into becoming a professor, you were the catalyst to help me do that. You brought me into USF. You introduced me to all those wonderful professors. Here's what you need to do. And I had very pointed conversations because of you with other professors on how to get in the classroom and how to become a professor. So I thank you for that. But Rich, back to the classroom. What is your goal every day? When you go into that classroom, what are you thinking about? And to be of service to the student, How do you do it? You're always trying to figure out where they are and where they're trying to go. And so we have a lot of assignments. You have to write a lot of things. So I can really read and figure out who Chris is, what's his background, what's he trying to accomplish. And a lot of times they're just throwing, you know, a dart at a dartboard. You walk into a sport management program and you say, hi, my name's Rich and I'm going to be a division one athletic director. And that sounds great. Everybody gets excited about it. Uh, the students who do maybe even a little bit better are the people who come in and they're like, hi, my name's Chris. I know I like sports. I know I will work hard, but I don't have any idea what this industry is about. And they feel embarrassed. And so you tell them there's nothing to be embarrassed about. It's completely fine. It's part of it. Let's work through the process. Let's figure out what the reality is in all these jobs. Let's go intern and figure it out. Uh, but every day you go into the classroom, I'm trying to figure out where are we? What are the fundamental skills we need to succeed out there in the industry? And how can I make sure you have all of those? And this is kind of consistent with what we're talking about here. Give yourself every chance to succeed. So students will say, how do I differentiate myself in the interview process? And this is what I say. Be able to articulate your unique story, your unique passions, goals, and how you come across in the world. If you like writing, why do you like writing? Tell me the time in which it, it, it came part of you, you know? That's interesting. I've hired hundreds of people. When they have a unique and passionate viewpoint, you're intrigued, you're leaning in, right? Whereas there's no AI formula, with all due respect to AI, because I right. think it's valuable as a tool, there's no way to outsmart this. You've got to know who you are. And every chance you can have to meet someone new or hone your skills of presentation, you'll get there quicker. Fair? Yes, and very accurate, too. You know, People buy people first, ideas second, and products third. So at the end of the day, once I hire you or not, um, if I don't, I'll move on to somebody else. But if I do, now we have to go to work together. And now I have to figure out you know, how's this going to go? And, and the interview process, you know, we'll go back to, I always use those relationship analogies because students have had a number of relationships. So I'm usually dealing with people in their mid twenties. So they've had you know some of those experiences. And so if something doesn't work out, I'm like, well, are you still together? Did you date anybody in high school? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, are you still together with them? I'm like, no. I'm like, are you happy or sad about that? They're like, I'm relieved. I'm like, okay, great. This job's going to be the same way. Not a big deal. I know it's disappointing today, but it's going to be okay. Trust me. Let's just keep moving forward. So 
as they kind of get into that process, they want to go into the interviews with these great answers to blow you away. So Chris Gargano, VP of the Jets, worked in this for decades. At age 24, you're not going to go in there and blow him away with your knowledge of broadcasting. It's just not going to happen. He knows too much. He's done it for too long. He's worked with the Raiders. He's been on air for a long time. He's has three World Series rings. He's just, he's got, look behind him. He's got a whole shelf of Emmys there. You're not going to blow him away. And so they're always looking for how to differentiate. I'm like, you know what amazing differentiator is? Is that you go in and you tell him that you're extremely interested. And he's going to ask, why do you want to do this? And you can say, because I like writing and I can give you a story about why I like writing. I said, and you know what works extremely well in this industry is humility. And then you can look him in the eye and say, I've liked writing, I think probably because I don't like math or the accounting class I'm in. So I'll probably go into my strength. And here's what I know. I would love to try it for a season. And I'll give you everything I have for the entire season. And at the end of it, I'll either decide that I like writing and I want to move this forward. Or I'll say, thank you. This was a wonderful experience. I got to be behind the scenes with an NFL team. My boy had team the Jets. It was the greatest thing ever. Thanks so much. But I want to go try some different things. With that attitude of, I don't know if this is what I want to do forever, but I'll give you everything I have for the season. That sells extremely well. You just mentioned a word in there, and that's perfect. That's a great angle to take. But you mentioned a word in there that I actually have in my notes to talk to you about today, which is, and you know where I'm going, humility. Yeah. And we're not saying that students coming out of college, graduate school, or whatever are, are not humble. That's not what we're talking about. It's the strength and power of humility to frame your story and goals through a lens of humility, which is so powerful. Rich, if someone were to say, hey, Chris, you're an older dude. You you were in the sports industry for 33, 34 years. What is the one key to your longevity? And, and let other people measure my success or not. That's not what I'm saying. But the longevity and, and establishing relationships, I would say hard work and humility right. it, and, and being grounded with who I was to other people and never, you know, being that person that in, in posed my will on them or things of that nature, letting being of service to others, especially as I got older. So Rich, as I say to you, humility learned at an early age is so valuable. I'm so glad you bring that forward. And I bet you do that often. I do because it's foreign to them. It's not what they've been taught. It's not what they've been told. They've been told that, you know, you, you've got to really get out there and, you know, promote yourself and promote your brand. And then they see all the stuff on social media, which we don't want to go down that road of whether that's a positive or a negative. Um, I think for young people, it's a tremendous negative. And I do talk about that in class, too. I think if you're humble, especially when you're young, you feel very vulnerable. And that's a lot of trying to instill confidence in your students and that it's OK if, you know, you're Chris who just likes sports. That's an embarrassing thing to say, as opposed to Rich, who's going to be a Division One AD. Rich has no idea what a Division One AD does. He's just saying it because it sounds good. So you try to empower them enough that the good people, the A's out there, aren't going to look down their nose at you if you don't have the answer, if you aren't a broadcasting expert. You know what? At 20 years old, that's enough. You're going to be at the bottom level, and you'll learn a lot around here. Those are the pieces when they when it clicks and they get it, they really take off running because now you can add value to somebody else's staff. What you take away are the memories of the people that you worked with, whether on the crew, your your sideline person, your color analyst, the director. And that's the same kind of what we're talking about here, that when people work, yes, you get so intense on what you're trying to accomplish, but it's those relationships that are lasting. And that's what you need to work for. Fair? When you're young, I think you probably think that it's about, you know, you know, Chris, how many World Series rings do you have from the Giants? Right. How many do you have? Three. Three. How often do you, how often do you wear them? They are in a safety deposit box in a bank in California. That's a true <laughs> so, statement. I know. And so, but that's what you think about when you're young, don't you? That I, if I can win a World Series and I'll get this ring and I'll wear it to a cocktail party and everybody will know who I am. They'll pat me on the back. And then as you grow and you, you go through it and you mature, you realize that it was those who were in your inner circle that really added the value to your life and made it fun. 
And it's neat if the event is the Giants winning a World Series, but when you work with the right people, it's just as neat as, as if it's a Los Gatos high school football game that we're still talking about, you know, a quarter of a century later. So let's back up and let's go to the 90s when Rich Cellini was at Fresno State. Yeah. Earning his BA, MA, and then your doctorate at the University of New Mexico. Tell us about your thought process as a young person majoring in communications, then deciding, and you and I have talked about this a million times, but I want to hear, I want you to tell everybody if you could, what was your thought process, your goals, and why education appealed to you so much? It's so admirable to get a doctorate. I think it's just the coolest thing. Tell me about your thought process back in the, the younger days of a Rich Cellini. So, you know, I go to junior college at Delta for the first year, and I interned at KCRA Channel 3. And you got to interview all these great people, and I was hooked at that point. I mean, when you're interviewing, you know, Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale and Larry Bird and Isaiah Thomas and Chuck Dale, I can just go on and on. And I'm like, this is nuts that I'm in this locker room, you know, Dennis Rodman. I mean, just great people to interview at the time is, what was I, 18? Then I just went and majored in communications, Fresno State, and, you know, did all the, the normal things, worked at the campus radio station, worked for community cable. And the truth of why I kept going in school is I wanted to get my master's degree because that seemed like a, a nice thing to do. And I couldn't get another on-air job. And back then it was all the local, you know, like people had their individual packages, Nevada, Fresno State, and Howard Zuckerman did a bunch of these packages. And I'd given him a tape of my work. And I don't forget what he said. He said, Chaloni. And he'd always mess up my name on purpose and think it's hilarious. He'd say, Chaloni, I looked at your stuff. And I got to tell you something, kid, you're pretty good. You really are. But I got to be honest with you. You have these huge glasses. You look like you're 12 years old. He says, you just do. I just, I thought about it. I showed my wife. I talked to other people. You call the game well. You're pretty good. I just can't put you on the air looking like you're 12. I, I, I'm sorry, I just can't do it. So at that point, you're kind of like, wow, what am I going to do? And then I ran into a, a, at the sideline of a New Mexico Fresno State football game. And Larry Tice, he went on to become an athletic director, I think just retired from uh, Southwest Texas State, or now it's just Texas State, uh, the Bobcats anyhow. And I introduced myself and we're chatting. And he told me that he was getting a doctorate in sports administration at New Mexico. I had never heard of such a thing. I was like, oh, what? And I was so intrigued and excited that I flew myself down to New Mexico, interviewed for the program, uh, interviewed with the woman who hired the teaching assistants, uh, did you know everything that I possibly could. And it was literally, I've been excited about a number of jobs through my life, I don't know that I was ever more excited and or relieved to get that one because I felt like I had just won the lottery, literally. And then my big goal there was to work in sports information, make contacts, look older, <laughs> and then I would go get a broadcasting job. But that was my only goal was teaching was never part of it. I just went and got a job doing AAA baseball in Fresno with the Grizzlies. And I thought, this is this is the best thing ever. This is going to be great because I'm this close to the big leagues. And this is going to be the most fun. And this is going to be wonderful. And I hated it. Sometimes what you think is going to be wonderful will be very different when you do it. So after that season, I went and I just walked on some campuses, uh, one of them being USF. And ended up, uh, Dr. Michael Robertson gave me a uh, gave me a class to teach. The origin story of Cellini as a professor. I love that. Yeah, you know what's what's funny about all this? I always had assumptions that successful people, and there's no logic in this assumption, by the way, that successful people that I would somehow recognize, whether it was John Robinson on the sideline coaching the Rams or John Madden in the booth, that they were just always there. So I guess there was no before and after. I guess John Robinson was never a kid or never a teenager. I guess he was just born one day and then was coaching the Rams the next day. 
I, I mean, I don't know what's going on inside my pea brain. But then at Fresno State, I started researching. And I remember thinking, ah, school's kind of a drag and this and that. And then I read that John Madden had everything but his dissertation for a doctorate in psychology. And I'm like, wait a minute, really? You look up John Madden, you look up Dick Enberg, who has a doctorate you know, from Indiana, and you start looking up all these people and their paths. And then you start thinking, well, maybe I could do something with myself that I want to do. Maybe. Because, you know, it doesn't, it never feels like it can be you. Uh, it feels like it's them. And then there's you over here. And so really, that's probably what I get the most pride in from all the years at USF is, is really trying to show people that there's not them and then us. We're all playing the same game and everybody has challenges we're going to learn how to overcome ours and we're going to get to where we want to be. And listen, I don't care if it's in the sports industry or not. I just want you to be successful and happy and do what you want to do. Cause you know, as you and I both know, it goes by quick. It doesn't have to be them. It can be you. If you're willing to put the work in and understand that you can be as good as anyone, if you do the work and that came up, throughout the podcast, it kept coming back to the work right. and enjoying the work. You know, it, right. hard work is fun if you find what you love and you marry the two, but you can't expect it, the sense of entitlement. But th that just goes without saying. You can't be entitled in it. You got to, forgive me here, bust ass. You have to well, work absolutely. hard. Absolutely. And which is why if you don't, it's one of the great things of the program at USF is you go through in 23 months and, you know, Somebody will always ask in the first class. So this is kind of a silly thing to ask. I'm almost embarrassed to say it, but what do the students do that succeed in here? Like, you know what they do? They work hard. They, they take every class serious, not overly serious, but they put forth a really solid, high-level effort, and they keep an open mind. And one of the cool learning tools we use is I have alums started this, sending me just vignettes small stories about their path and now i start asking for some and they write these wonderful stories to share about how just keep an open mind and things will change and and the road twists and you can't do the work that all the cool guests you've had on here for a long time if you don't really enjoy it you you, you just can't you can't if i didn't really like the students at usf i i, I couldn't still be teaching them and be any good at it. There's really no separation between what I do for enjoyment and what I do to get paid. There, there's, there's really no line. That's called alignment. This is where I feel bad for the current generation with the social media stuff. And I really talk about it a lot. All the stuff those people post, their life's not perfect. You have to embrace the imperfections. It's the fun of it. it it's not, if it was perfect, it's not, it's not fun. It's not real. You have to, embrace the down don't beat yourself up over the imperfections because the students always think that if i'm imperfect that there's something wrong with me because they see all the perfect on that little screen and i'm like that's not reality that's life and it's okay and it makes you a lot more attractive not only to employers but just other people when you realize you know what's going on what's funny is so many of the alums who reach out, which is it's always an honor, who manage people. I, I can't tell you the number of people who don't understand that the reason I hired you is to make my job easier. Because if you're making my job harder, why do I need you? So pounding that into the students, I'm like, listen, if you go make the boss's life easy, they'll figure out a way to keep you around. They're like, well, how do I do that? I'm like, part of your job is to figure out what the, you need to be doing to make their life easy. So read the room. Figure it out. Listen, I don't, I, don't, I don't have a shot sheet for you. You've got to be able to think on your feet. That's what we do here. Leadership and critical thinking. You're going to be able to think about this now. And that's another way of thinking about service. Everyone thinks it's a leader of service to everyone, which is true. But it goes the other way. If you're a great employee, you're servicing people around you, above you, making their lives easier. That's common sense. Well, you know, it's the woman who used to run our program in Orange County, Peggy O'Leary. And I say this at the end of the first class. She had a saying, taking care of yourself is taking care of others. Think of how much better your life would be 
if everybody in it had their act together. All family members, people you work with, if they just had their stuff in a circle, so to speak, how much better would your life be? Everybody wants to fix everybody else and help everybody else. If people want help, they can come to you. But most of the time, they're just going to watch your example. So why don't you go be great? And then they'll follow. And if they have questions, they'll ask. But go lead by example. It's the most powerful form of leadership. It's the best example. I'll just listen. The guy always has his act together. He's always a pro. He's always upbeat. It's like, I don't, we don't need a bunch of rah-rah speeches. This is just how we do things. Here's something I feel very strongly about. And I say this to my clients, not so much the students, they seem to get it, but people yeah. that I, I consult with, right? And I've said over the years to people, especially again, as I got older and started to figure this out for myself, which is this. If you're going to lead people, you can't just come in for the finite amount of time you're in the office or the arena or wherever you may go to work and expect your skills, knowledge, emotional intelligence, et cetera, and then go home, interact with your family and do the things you do on your life and expect you to improve as a leader. This takes work. This takes yeah. studying. It takes passion for understanding trends in leadership psychology. Mm -hmm. However you access that information to be a great leader, talking to people you love, admire, and respect about leadership. In other words, this is an investment. This is all the time to right. lead. Do you have similar conversations with your students and or people that you've mentored, the thousands over the years in your 25 years at USF? I'm very passionate about it. And I even have an edge to my voice because I feel so strongly about it. I'm very empathic when I deliver the messaging, but on the show like this and talking to you, I'm cutting straight to the chase on how much I feel that this is a necessity, especially today in the complexities of our world and the world of business. Yeah, I don't, there's no other way to do it. I mean, there's no, it, it goes back to what you just said. There's no way to get around the work. And if you don't genuinely care about those you lead, it shines through. Like you mentioned AI, everybody wants a formula to lead. They want it to be a formula that they can implement and maybe like fast food, we can replicate and have consistency. And you know, you see it with coaches, you see it a lot of places, you, you have to be willing to adjust. That's why I think so much in Nick Saban from how much he's changed. He's been successful the whole time, but he's changed so much with the coordinators, with what they do, with how, you know, the fundamentals are still the same. The process is the same. That's not easy to wrap your head around. How to manage those games, how to work the clock with the passing offense. I mean, all those things he's had to study and learn and then learn all the kids every year. There's no way those kids play that hard for him if he doesn't have an investment. I mean, he's got, you know, they still talk about how he goes to the homes doing recruiting and all this stuff. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Yeah, the kid said he was going to sign, but I'm putting on a coat and tie. I'm showing up. We're going to their house to say congratulations. Welcome to Alabama. That's how I do it. Yeah, I know I got a private plane. I get all that, but it's still time. People just lose sight of that. People want to stop doing what it is. And then the other part is you're going to have a team of people. You have to change your leadership style as they change and grow. Otherwise, they're going to get dull and bored. So it's you either really have a passion for people and all their imperfections and the difficulties that come with that. But I, I don't I don't get bogged down in the imperfections and the problems. I, I really keep the focus on the joy and the success. And that's that's a trick in and of itself. All right, Rich, the rapid fire all star moments. These are quick answers. Mm -hmm. Rapid fire, Cellini. Then I'll ask you a couple of bonuses at the end. You ready, Rich? Here we go. All-star moments. One, how do you deal with adversity? Understand that it always has an end point and it'll make you better at the end of the day. Not enjoyable going through it, but at the end, it'll be a positive. Two, how do you give yourself fuel? Take care of yourself health-wise and be of service to others is the best fuel. Three, what does never give up mean to you? You don't get to write the script. So don't worry if the outcome isn't what you expected. Keep pushing forward. Um, 
And I'll even throw in the Kobe Bryant quote here because I know you like Kobe and so do all the students. Um, it'll actually be better than you thought it would be. It'll be different, but it'll be better than you thought it would be. Four, what is the value of collaboration? The richness of your life will be dependent on the caliber of people you collaborate with. Five, hiring people. You talk about this all the time. What is the number one thing you say to a graduate student about to interview for a job, advice-wise? Do your homework. Figure out how you can make their life easier. That has appeal to people. And number three would be be humble. But figure out how to make their life easier. That will have appeal. It's not about you. It's about them. Six, describe yourself as a leader in one sentence. A servant leader. Seven, what's the difference between a manager and a leader? Managers do things right with consistency and order. Leaders set the vision and the long-term goals of the company. They also create change and movement. All right, Rich. Uh, now I'm really rocking and rolling here. All right, number eight, who is the best leader you have personally been around and why? The professors at New Mexico, Dr. Griffin to Ev Rogers to Greg Remington to Gary Barnett in the booth, you know, coach at Colorado, coach at Northwestern, John Robinson with all his success, Terry Donahue. I mean, I got to work with so many great people through the years. And they all had the similar characteristics. They had the ability to bring out the best in people. They figured out who you were in a fairly short order and what needed to happen to bring out the best in everybody. Terry Donahue. I loved Terry Donahue. Terry Donahue, all the Rose Bowls, all the success at UCLA, would always ask you questions as if he had no idea. Hey, don't, don't you think Mississippi State's going to need to run the ball more in the second half, Rich? Don't you think, man, they're not doing a good job of completing passes? And I'm like, Terry, you're in the College Football Hall of Fame. What are you asking me if I think Mississippi should run the ball more in the second half for? But he knew that's what needed to happen. But he wanted to make you think that it was your idea. And so then when you came on the air, you know, back from halftime break in the studio, you'd start going through those things and you'd feel you'd feel 10 feet tall. And then all the while, he knew everything that was going on. So I, I really think it's more of those those traits of being the servant leader. And students will ask me, Chris, how come more people don't do it? I'm like, it takes a lot of energy to figure out who other people are. It's much easier just to run on your own hamster wheel. To really motivate somebody, you got to figure out who they are. And it takes time. And you got to think about it. But you have to have conversations. Piece of trivia. Did you know that you and I were born in the same hospital? Kaiser, Geary no. Street, San Francisco. I, that, well, no, that is that is fantastic knowledge. Cellini, this has been fantastic. Thank you very much, Rich. Chris, pleasure's all mine. And we thank Rich very much for being on the show. I have three takeaways from this conversation. Number one, you heard what Rich said. He did not like his first job as the play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Fresno Grizzlies. Yet, he did not let that deter him, and he kept on his journey. Number two, the value of being humble. You're graduating from college right now. And you have a decision to make. Yes, you don't want to hold back your achievements. But if you frame them, you heard Dr. Cellini, in a way that is humble and showing humility, you will get so far. Rich has seen students each and every year interviewing for jobs and internships through 26 years of experience. It behooves us to listen to his advice. Number three, when you get in the business world, people value the top three things. One, people, two, ideas, three, product. Knowing that will help you with your job search. What a valuable conversation, and I appreciate Rich very much for being on the show. And I appreciate you each and every week for being part of Keep the Line Moving. Have a great week, everybody. Every week, you hear guests on this podcast talk about some of their biggest leadership challenges. As a leader, you want to make an impact on those you lead and reach your organization's goals while also optimizing your time management. Wherever you are in your leadership journey, we could all use some help. This is what we focus on with our group and individual coaching services. To book a call or get more information, email me directly at chrisg at garganoleadership.com. 
or visit our website at garganoleadership.com. For our podcast and video producer, Jack Radutsky, and our marketing coordinator, Savin Narwhal, have a great week, everybody.